resurrection of Christ. You know, just a, a week previously, we talked about his triumphant entrance into the new Jerusalem. There was tremendous shouting and praise and worship. It was a significant prophetic fulfillment of the Old Testament of Zechariah and the book of Psalms. And hundreds of scriptures were fulfilled, but he told that the time would come that they would betray him. They would mock him, scourge him, whip him, uh, crucify him, and he, and he would die. And he kept telling his disciples this reality, but they didn't have ears to hear, and they didn't have eyes to see, and they didn't have a heart to receive. They couldn't, they couldn't perceive. And, and, of course, then he also told them about the, that he was going to be raised from the dead. And, of course, we've just gone through Good Friday, and, uh, and, and, and here in the midst of, uh, of chapter 27, the disciples are in the darkest moment and this is Matthew chapter 28 is where we're going to begin. The disciples are in the, in, the, in the darkest moment of their time. The greatest despair, the greatest disagony that anybody could ever possibly know. And the disciples are in it. I mean, they're down in the valley. I remember, I don't know why, but when I was a little kid, my dad would hold me on his lap and sing down in the valley. The valley is so low. <laughs> no wonder I, I grew up depressed, you know, <laughs> and oppressed. But that's what my dad used to sing to me. I can't remember him singing anything, you know, uplifting and beautiful, wonderful. It seems like to me a lot of your country music today is all down and out, you know. You know, they're like a newborn calf, you know, bawling in a tin barn roof on a cold winter night, as Brother Hagen used to say, you know. I mean, just sad, just down and out and blue and can barely lift their heads and don't look around. But there seems to be a lot of people like that today. Now, I can understand people in the world being depressed. I can understand people in the world not having no hope, not having no future, having nothing to get up out of bed over, you know, not putting a smile on their face, but the body of Christ, the church, the bride, the redeemed, the chosen, the called, the elect, those who are seated in heavenly places. How could we be so sad? And yet the Bible, listen, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. But the way a lot of people act today, they act like they've been pickled in lemon juice. And, and, and I think it's the same reason the disciples, and I'm not denying I've gone through it as a pastor, as a husband, as a father, as a man. And yet, why do we, why, why do we allow depression? You know, depression is a terrible thing. I mean, depression does a lot of things to you. First of all, I think it expands your waistline. I really do. I think depression does a lot of things. It, it's, as a matter of fact, depression and fear and anxiety is one of the things that is, is making the medical world so wealthy. Did you know that? You know, the Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart. Amen. A merry heart. Maybe that's why women with the name Mary, maybe they're more happier than women whose names aren't Mary. <laughs> a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And here the disciples are. They're so depressed. And in the natural, I can't blame them. They're so sad. Not only are the disciples sad, all the disciples are scattered. And Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Christ, and, and all, of, all, all of those who, who, who were connected to Christ in an intimate way, it's like the end of the world for them. I mean, they have no hope, no future, no tomorrow. They can just barely get along, you know, on barely get along street. <laughs> and it's because they didn't have revelation knowledge. It's because they didn't hear what Jesus said. They didn't get a hold of what he declared. You know, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said it? Shall he not do it? Has he spoken it? Shall he not bring it to pass? I mean, doesn't God say, I meet all of your needs according to your riches and glory? But somehow the devil gets us in the headlock and he begins to twist and begins to turn. He begins to blind. He begins to death and he begins to harden our heart through lies and deceptions and cares and so forth and so on. And so here it is. It's supposed to be resurrection morning. But actually the ladies, they're headed to the tomb of Christ to finish the burial process. See, they ought to be getting up and shouting and singing, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive, hallelujah, he's alive, you know. But, you know, the disciples are sleeping in. They can't barely think. I bet if you'd have seen those, those, those men, tears would have been rolling down their cheeks. 
They'd have been blowing their nose with a handkerchief. They would have been moaning and groaning and, and, and just singing the blues. Hello, when they ought to have been shouting victory. They ought to have been shouting victory. Hallelujah. Oh, but Pastor Mike, you just don't know how bad it is out there. I know how bad it is, but the Bible says when things, these things begin to happen, look up because your redemption draweth nigh. See, where iniquity abounds, the grace does much more abound. The darker the room, the brighter the light. Amen? So take a look what it says here in verse 1, chapter 28. In the, in, the end, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre, or the tomb where Christ was. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat upon it. Now, the ladies were there. They, they felt it. They seen it. They experienced it. They heard it. See, I, I want you to know, I, I believe this is what Christianity is supposed to be. I think Christianity is supposed to be a mighty earthquake, an earth-shaking experience. I think, I think salvation, I think walking with Christ is supposed to be explosive. It's supposed to be powerful. It's supposed to be amazing, awesome, astounding. I really do. But what we've done is we've turned Christianity into a, a dress-up-your-best-Sunday-morning experience. And, and that's not Christianity. I mean, Christianity is so much more than than lapel pins and bumper stickers and, and, and churches with steeples, you know. And notice what it says. There was a mighty earthquake and an angel sat upon the door. Now, they saw that angel, by the way. They saw that angel. I mean, no, we can see angels. Now, I'm telling you, we can see angels. Now, we're not seeking for the manifestation of the appearance of angels, but I want you to know that even like the old-style radio station, when you'd begin to tune in that dial and you'd begin to bring in that station to look for, when you could be on just the side channel and static, just a lot of static, a lot of noise, but as you get closer, it gets clearer and clearer until where the signal is so precise and so clear, you cannot miss you cannot miss a word or a song that is sung. I'm telling you right now, I know this in my heart, that there is a place in the Holy Ghost where everything is so clear, so precise. You know, a lot of people in the body of Christ are, 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 are kind of lost. Do you know what I mean? They're kind of lost. They're kind of like the prodigal son. They're lost in the fog and the smog and the dirt and the filth and the garbage and the confusion of this world. But as you begin to tune in, I'm telling you, not only will you hear the voice of God very precisely, and he'll say to you, this is the way walk ye in it, but you will see him, and you will see his angels. And you will see the things that you're dealing with. I believe with all my heart when Jesus will look upon the sick and the infirmed, he saw what they needed. He saw the problem. He saw the root. He saw the hardship. He saw the difficulty. When you're in the spirit, everything is revealed to you. And that's where we as ministers of the gospel need to be. We, and men of God and women of God, we need to be to the place where like Jesus at the woman at the well, he looked at her. Yes, he saw the problem, the sin, the difficulties, but not to destroy her, but to deliver her. And he said to her, go call your husband. And she says, Lord, I have not a husband. He said, that's right, you've had five of them. And now the man that you're living with is not your husband. Now, he didn't say that to put her down to condemn her because he had offered her the, 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 the water of life. He'd offered. He said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. But he saw what she needed, and he could deal with it. You know, a lot of times, I'll be honest with you, as a minister of the gospel, we just, why can't we see what God is doing in people's lives? I mean, when I'm in the spirit, when I'm tuned in, you know, have you ever heard somebody take a guitar? And I'm not a guitarist. I'm not a piano player. You know, the only thing I play is the juice harp. That's my mouth. <laughs> but, you know, but my wife, you know, we bring this older guy who comes and he tunes our pianos. And he does it by ear. He doesn't have any equipment. And he begins to hit that key and he begins to tune and hit the key. And he's got perfect, he, he's got perfect hearing when it comes to tuning of a, 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 of, a, of a piano. I'm telling you what, when you begin to really zero in, when you begin to focus in, when you begin to cry out, when you begin to seek, when you begin to reach, when you begin to surrender and yield, all of a sudden you begin to become tuned to the the things of the spirit 
and God begins to show you things. And you're not even leaning to the understanding of your mind. Your human intellect is not even involved. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Has that ever happened to you? You just have the mind of Christ. You, you, see, you see through the eyes of Christ. You have the heart of God. And all of a sudden, you're speaking prophetic words. You're speaking truth. You're speaking revelation to somebody's life. And they begin to cry. I've seen it many times through the year where I would just speak to somebody just a couple words. And tears would begin to roll down their face. There was a man dying from cancer in the mechanical... Uh, mecha Connellsburg Hospital, and, and uh, uh, someone called me up and said, Pastor Mike, this guy who owns this lumber mill up in Shirleysburg, PA, he's dying from cancer. They've shoved him into a room. He's turned all yellow. He's skin and bones. He's dying. Will you go and see him? And I, 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 know, I know I couldn't help him. I said, well, give me a day. I got I to gotta fast. I got to pray. Give me a day. And so for the rest of that day, I fasted and I prayed in tongues. For when you know not how to pray as you ought, the Spirit himself maketh the intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And I spoke the word, and I prayed in tongues, and I spoke the word. And so the next day came around, and Brother Paul Waite, who came to our church at that time in Three Springs Assembly God Church, he actually his job was to put under the flesh because he was a grave digger. <laughs> and Paul called me up and said, are you ready to go, Pastor? I said, yeah, let's go. And so Paul was a prayer warrior, and so Paul and I on the other way up to McConnellsburg, he was praying, and I was praying in the Holy Ghost. And matter of fact, Paul had, gotten, Paul, Paul had gotten filled with the Holy Ghost in our church. He was a man in his 40s. And so we got up there, and, and he said, Pastor, I'm just going to sit out here and pray. You go, see, you, you go see Chester, or you go see Alvin. You go see Alvin Bloombaugh. And so I went in to see Alvin, and he was laying on the bed. He looked like he'd just come out of a Nazi concentration camp, and he's laying there. And I, 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 and I began to try to talk to him, and nothing could break through. His heart was hard. He, he could think because a lot of times before people died, their mind is very clear. He could think, but he, he, I couldn't get through. And all of a sudden, I knew it. I can't do this in the flesh. So I bowed my head, and I, I cried out to God, and tears began to roll down my face. The love of God began to rise up. I can't remember what I said to him. I just said a couple of words, and he broke like a dam, and he began to weep, and he began to cry, and he gave his heart to Christ. He surrendered his life to Jesus. He was in his 60s and gave his heart to Jesus, and I laid hands on him. And I, honestly, that day his appetite came back to him, and three days later he was out of the hospital. But see, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And I'm telling you what, as you go deeper into the things of the spirit, you go deeper into the things of God, you go deeper into the reality of Christ and these things which seem like they're make-believe, these things that seem like they're not really real, they have no substance, they have no flesh and blood, they begin to take upon themselves flesh and blood. They begin to take upon themselves substance. And then all of a sudden they begin to manifest themselves in the flesh. And so here Mary is and Mary Magdalene, they come down, beginning of the morning to finish the job that needed to be done for the burial of Christ. And verse 2, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. I mean, his countenance was like lightning. I, I don't know if you've ever seen a streak of a bright streak of lightning in the in the heavens, especially in the midst of the darkness. And it just it just is it's beyond description. It's I mean, I, I'm sure all the hair on their heads and their necks and their arms were standing up. I mean, they all of a sudden here an angel is, and you know the Bible says he's the father of lights. That's who God is, in whom there's no burden, with need, or shadow of turning. He's the giver of every good gift. And here he is, He's, he dwelleth in a light which no man can approach unto. And here is an angel which is a servant of God, and he's, he, he's literally like a streak of lightning. Now, I'm telling you, I really literally believe in a li believer's life, and this is where we need to go in the Holy Ghost. There is a place in the Spirit where all of a sudden the light of heaven begins to glow and begins to shine and radiate out of your human flesh. I've heard of it. You ever see those old Catholic paintings? of the saints and they have a halo around their head or they're, 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 they got a globe shining around their face. There is some truth to that. When Moses came off of Mount Sinai, the Bible says he glowed with such a bright light that they begged him and he had to wear a cloth. He had to wear a veil over his face because of the glory that was upon him. Now, if that's the glory of the old, what is the glory of the new? Uh, if you've never read Signs, Wonders, and Miracles about the story about Mary Woodworth Etter, you know, I, I really believe in all my studying and all my reading, she's probably uh, one of the most uh, uh, mightily used people of God other than in the, in the Bible. I mean, just 
and, and, and there'd be times when she'd stand there and as she was standing there and as she was preaching, she'd begin to glow like a light bulb. And she'd become so bright, the people were just astounded and amazed. But see, what was that? That wasn't her. That was the Spirit of God within her. That was the life of Christ within her. That was the resurrection power. I got to meditating there in Romans chapter 8, where it says that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead it dwells in you. He will quicken your mortal bodies. He will quicken your mortal bodies. The other day I, I turned on the radio and I, I heard uh, they were having a telethon for, for children. They have incurable cancer. And it just about broke my heart. And tears came to my eyes. And I was thinking, Lord, all these, these children, and, and they're talking about how they have to sit in a hospital room and they don't have nothing to do. Will you send in puzzles? Will you send in games? Because they're sitting there waiting for the next chemo, next radiation. And I was thinking, Lord, they shouldn't have to be sitting there waiting for their next chemo. They shouldn't have to be sitting there waiting for their next radiation. They shouldn't have to sit there going through the pain and the loneliness and agony. I said, where's the church? Where's the body? The believers ought to be in there and laying hands on them and casting out the cancer and healing Healing the sick. Matter of fact, it says in the book of Acts that the disciples gave great evidence to the resurrection of Jesus. You know, I'm just way off of my notes this morning, but I want you to understand something here. That we expect people to come to the house of God, the church, the gathering. We expect people to get saved and to live for God, and yet we don't have what the early church had. See, we, how in the world can we expect people to get right with God if we don't have the goods? You know, Peter said, uh, silver and gold have I not, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Brothers and sisters, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We should have the goods. We should have the goods. And I know what's wrong. The only thing between us and walking into that realm where all Things are possible. And Jesus said, the works I did, you shall do also. And greater works than these shall you do because I go on to my Father which is in heaven. The only thing that is stopping Mike Yeager from walking in the fullness of the Spirit is the veil of the flesh. That's all it is, just the flesh. Now, I, 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 that's, a, that's a mouthful, isn't it, though? <laughs> you know, because it's the flesh. That's constantly fighting. You know, it says, walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And it says, the spirit and the flesh, they war against one another. And so here they see the angelic being. Um, I have had the privilege of seeing angelic beings. Uh, I had an angel come to me one time. To me, it was in the flesh. And it was a frightening thing. I, I fell before the angel, and the angel picked me up and said, no, no, you don't bow before me. <laughs> and he's just a messenger of God. But you know what? The angels are co-workers with us in the kingdom. Did you know that? They're, they're angelic messengers sent forth to minister to those or for those who shall be heirs of salvation. We don't worship angels puffed up with our foolish imagination, worshiping of angels, and, and, and no, no, but they're there to help us and work with us. Uh, I, I just love, as, as, brother, uh, as that brother was preaching the other night, he was saying the more words you speak because the angels hearken to the voice of the Lord, and as you speak the word, the angels begin to go to work for you. I love that he said, when you have a prayer meeting, there's only one or two of you there, and you begin to pray, he said, and you get to thinking, this isn't going to do any good. There's only one or two or five of us. But as you begin to pray the word and speak the word, and you begin to declare the word, the angelic beings begin to go forth into your community, and they begin to do the work of the kingdom. I wrote a book about it called The Chronicles of Micah, number one. I'm, I'm starting to work on the second one again. I lost it in my hard drive. But I'll tell you what is real. The angelic world is real, and the demonic world is real. And here an angel of the Lord sitting upon the, 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 the sepulchre where Jesus had been. In verse 4, and for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. If, you would, if we had time to look at the four Gospels, you'd discover that Pilate gave permission to the Pharisees and the, and, and the high priests to send uh, warriors down there, soldiers down there, guards down there. And so they thought they were going to keep him in the tomb. But they couldn't keep him in the tomb. See, I'll tell you right now, uh, the devil, he, he, he tried to keep Jesus from being raised from the dead. But it was absolutely impossible 
It'd be just like all the politicians of the world today would get together, all the military leaders, all the dictators, all the kings would get together and say, you know what? We're tired of the sun rising in the morning, and we're not. We're going to forbid it. We're going to stop the sun from rising tomorrow morning. I mean, no, that's nothing but a big old joke. They couldn't stop the natural sun from rising any more than all the powers of darkness, the demonic powers of hell could prevent Jesus from coming out of that grave. <laughs> Aren't you glad? But I want you to realize that same Jesus that came out of the tomb, that same Christ that rose again on the third day, he's in you. And I want you to know when you get a revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, when you get a revelation that Jesus, the greater one inside of you, when you get a revelation, no devil in hell, no sickness, no disease, no government, no power in this earth can hold you down. <laughs> they can't stop the Christ within you. Do you understand that? The, the, the governments of the world in the early church tried to kill Christianity. They tried to kill Christ in the hearts of men and women, but the more they tried to put it out, the more the fire was fanned. The hotter the heat became and the more it spread. Oh, brothers and sisters, we have so much given to us. We are so privileged. We are so honored. And so here, they, 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 these men they had put in front of the tomb, they laid as dead men, and they were shaking. <laughs> Amen. Look what it says here in verse 4. And for the fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. See, people say, well, I don't, I don't believe falling down under the power of God. Let, let me tell you something. Let, let me just be honest with you. When somebody has been, now this is just an angelic being. This is not a believer. Do you understand that the Bible says that he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than any of the prophets that lived in the Old Testament did, did you know that we have authority and power and dominion that we we have we what, angels don't come anywhere near a born-again spirit-filled Holy Ghost man or woman does it now listen if they fell when that angelic being appeared when the Spirit of God begins to manifest itself when the Spirit of God begins to flow people can't stand they'll fall as dead men I'm talking about believers I, I, I seen it happen. I, I, I was in a church over in Germany, and, 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 and I, I had an interpreter, and I was standing up there, and I, I, I was really had been digging in, and I had really been uh, ministering on the subject of being sold out lock, stock, and barrel, taking up your cross, denying yourself, going all the way with God. And this is what I'm preaching to German churches. And the German churches are kind of hard. They're kind of dead. They're kind of cold, you know. And I'm talking 27 years ago. And as I was preaching in this church, I got about maybe halfway to two-thirds way done with my message and all of a sudden they began to fall out of their chairs weeping and wailing and crying the whole congregation I'm not lying they fell out of their chairs weeping weeping I had to stop they were laying on the floor weeping and crying and wailing I had to stop and I said I said I said to uh, the, the, the guy who was standing there doing the interpretation I said do you know this congregation he said yeah I said does this happen all the time he says we've never seen this before this has never happened before. And it began to happen wherever I went. I, I was speaking in a church one time, and the Spirit of God fell, and I had to get out and get to another church. And later on in the afternoon, I caught up the pastor, and I said to, and, 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 you know, wanted to get together with the pastor. And he says, does that always happen when you preach? I said, what's that, Brother Bill? His name was Bill Aragonian. He, he said, well, he said, uh, you know what? He said, uh, I, I melted to the floor. He said, I laid on the floor for two hours. And that morning, they had all the children in the sanctuary. They had all the teenagers in the sanctuary. And, 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 and I said, well, he, I said, what happened? He said, well, after two hours, I got up. He said, I thought everybody had gone home. She, he said, everybody was still on the floor, including the children, and nobody could move or talk for two hours. See? And he never let me come back to his church again. <laughs> and he was Pentecostal. He was full gospel, but... A move of God scared him. See that? I'm telling you, as the angel manifested himself, those people fell as dead men, and even the disciples of God were afraid. I'm telling you, there is a place in a resurrection power. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken your mortal bodies. You know what? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, high places. We're not going to win this battle with psychology. We're not going to win this battle with counseling. We're not going to win this battle in the flesh. We're not going to win this battle with fantasy see bulletins and and pretty looking glossy colored books we're gonna have to do it in the holy ghost 
You know, I'm totally convinced you begin to move in the power of the Holy Ghost, you won't even have to buy time on TV or radio. They'll give it to you. I'm telling you, man, there is a place in the Holy Ghost where the flesh dare not stand. And, 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 and I've heard people say, I don't believe in falling in the, down in the power. Listen, I've seen a lot of people fall down in the spirit. They didn't believe in it. I was in a Baptist church. It was celebrating 98 years of ministry in, 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 in right outside of London. Actually, it was pretty. It was in, the, 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 in, in Great Britain, Wales. And, and uh, I, my son Michael, I believe, was with me. And we're, I'm in this church, and, and I'm ministering, and the word of the Lord is just coming forth. It's just flowing like a river out of my belly. And when I got done, all of a sudden, I looked at the people, and I could, by the Spirit of God, I could read their mail. I knew what was going on. It, it, it was like a teleprompter, you know. And, I, you know, sometimes they say our president is the teleprompter president. I like to be the spiritual teleprompter preacher. I'm just a reading what I'm seeing. And then I began to call them out. And I said, sir, you there. Yes, you. And I told them what was going and what was happening. I said, c c c come up here. And as he'd walk towards me, they'd melt. They'd fall. Boom. I caught another one. Boom. I caught. And as they're falling, these old men got up and they tried to help these people up. Come on, get up, get up. And I said, they're okay, they're okay. Just let them alone. And, 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 and so when the ministry got done, the young pastor was surrounded by these older men. And they looked like they had been there all those 90-some years. And they fired them on the spot because I found out they were not Pentecostal, full gospel people. They'd never seen the power of God. You know, sometimes I'm telling you, I know this in my spirit. I, we've heard, well, if the worship is just right, if, if we're all just in unity, if we're all just moving, if we're all just hungry for God. Now, listen, that does help. That is a blessing. That is wonderful. But I'm telling you, there is a place in the Holy Ghost, brother and sister, where you can go into the deadest church, the most sinful church, the, the darkest church on, on the face of the earth, and the power of God will fall and knock them to their face and deliver them and save them. See, and that's where we need to get. See, we're going in, we're trying to fight the devil with BB guns, you know, <laughs> when, we, when we need grenade throwers. So here all of a sudden, and verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the woman, listen to this, the first thing, said unto the woman, Fear not ye, fear not ye, for I know, listen, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified now there's so much revelation knowledge here first of all over and over and over every time you see God begin to physically manifest himself he always says don't be afraid don't be afraid don't get in fear don't get in anxiety don't worry don't panic now on me why because fear is of the devil now the beginning of fear the fear of the Lord is the beginning wisdom I'm not talking about fear of God because we're going to see that in a minute but what I'm talking about there's a satanic fear there's a satanic worry the Bible says in the last days the hearts of many would wax would, would, would fail because of fear because of fear they're afraid See, and, and that, that, that fear is the opposite of faith. You've got to get rid of fear, brothers and sisters. You cannot let fear live in your heart. I don't know what your fear is. I've had a lot of fears through my life. It was, it was, it actually, it, 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 it came from my forefathers. I mean, it's a curse. I mean, I'm telling you right now, my uncle was f afraid, just fearful of getting cancer. He was a big man, a husky man, uh, Uncle Warren. And I saw him shrivel up and die from leukemia, from cancer. He died from cancer. My sister uh, last year died from cancer. A lot of my relatives have died from cancer. You know what? But God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. See, I'm not afraid of cancer. You know, you can't believe how much the medical world is controlled by fear. Now, we don't have to get ugly and ignorant and bitter and resentful at them. But you understand fear is a tool of the devil. Don't let fear get a hold of your heart. My wife and I, we've had a wonderful marriage, but there had been some years where we went through living hell. I mean, we went through hell in our marriage because my father had a spirit of fear, and he also had a, 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 a it was just a goofy thing where, where you know, he, he thought my mother was committing adultery on him, and it tormented him. And my mother was faithful to my father, but it was a tormenting spirit. I tell you what, that thing was on me. I had to fight it tooth and nail, and I'd get the victory, and then it'd get a hold of me. I'd get the victory and get a hold of me. And, 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 and my wife and I, back in about the year 2000, when our little girl died and my mother died, we went through a time where my wife had her, had her suitcases packed. She was going to leave me. 
Do you understand? And I began to accuse her of having a relationship with a man that I knew that was not a part of our church but was a visitor. And I would attack her and I would tell her because I thought God was showing me she was committing adultery. See, it was a demonic spirit. And, and I knew in my heart, in my heart of hearts, that it was a lie. I knew that God was calling out to me. He was saying, son, no matter what, you got to seek me. And finally, I had a breakthrough in my heart, in my life. And we had a breakthrough in our marriage, and God delivered me from it. <laughs> but see, that spirit of fear, that spirit, it says fear bringeth torment. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. People are committing suicide because of fear. I heard about, about a multi-millionaire in Germany, one of the wealthiest men in Germany with a wonderful family. His, his, he was losing a lot of his wealth. I mean, he still was worth $15 million, but he lost billions of dollars. He stepped in front of a train and left his wife and his children behind with the financial mess. See, that's the devil. Brothers and sisters, we dare not. And so he said, do not be afraid. Not only that, now in this context, it's when God begins to show up. You know, when God begins to show up, a lot of times people begin to run for the door. And, and they, they say, well, that ain't God. Well, listen, does it, do you see the fruits of the Spirit? Does it bring healing? Does it bring joy? Does it bring purity? Does it bring obedience? Does it bring holiness? What is the, the sign and the wonder of the miracle? Is it contrary to the nature of God? And people's hearts get filled with fear. They say, well, I, I, don't, I don't believe that God knocks people down. I, I don't believe that speaking in tongues is of God. I, 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 don't, I don't believe that somebody should glow like a light bulb when they're preaching. Jesus did on the Mount of Transfiguration, by the way. It says his clothes shine like the whitest fuller in the brightness of the sun. Like sun, the sun shining off of snow. You ever seen sun shine off of the snow? You can't even look at it. You'll go blind. And yet all of a sudden God says, okay, I'm going to come. Somebody's faithful. Somebody's obedient. Somebody's seeking me. Somebody's walking in the resurrection. I'm going to come. I'm going to reveal myself because that's what the disciples said. Lord, grant by thy hands that mighty signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy Christ child. And it says they gave great evidence to the resurrection of Jesus. I think it's time we do it. I think it's time we give great evidence that he's alive. That he's not dead. He's, st he, he's still Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And so people's heart begins to get filled with fear. And he says, don't be afraid. Don't, 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 don't accept the spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. And he said, so he says to these ladies that had come, he said, unto the ladies, fear not ye. For I know, I know, I know that you seek Jesus, which is crucified. Now here's the key to God showing up in your life. You begin to seek Jesus. No, I mean you seek him. I mean, you hunger for him like a, like, a, like, like, like a deer in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. I, I get to, back to thinking every time God would show up, and God has showed up in my life so many times, I don't exalt my experiences because the experiences are for everybody. Well, Pastor Mike, I don't, want, I don't want to have an experience. Let me tell you something. You get to seeking Jesus, you'll have an experience. There was a Muslim man who truly wanted to know the real God, and I heard his testimony personally. He shared this. He was bowing towards Mecca every day. He didn't know what else to do, but he said, God, I want to know you. I I want to know you. I want to know you. And one day he's out there on a sand dune and he's bowed over toward praying towards Mecca. His heart is seeking God. And all of a sudden he sees a pair of sandals and he sees feet in the sandals. He saw holes in the feet. He looked up and there's two hands with nail scarred hands. He looked up and he knew right away it was Jesus. And he said, I am the one you seek. And he disappeared. And that Muslim man, he got born again full of the Holy Ghost and on fire. Let me tell you something. You seek Jesus and he will show up. He will show up. I'm telling you, guaranteed, guaranteed, you seek first the kingdom of God. You seek him. You seek him. See, understand, I know without a shadow of a doubt, the enemy, the adversary, the devil, he's doing everything to stop that resurrection Lord be, to become more real to us, alive to us. See, that Jesus... See, people don't understand, faith is simply when Jesus becomes more real to you than the problem. Did you know that? That's what faith is. Think about it. Faith is simply when the word of God, and in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Faith is simply when Jesus, the word, becomes more real to you than the bill. He becomes more real to you than the sickness, the ailment, the pain. 
He becomes more real to you than the problem. He becomes bigger than the problem. Like David and Goliath. Everybody's running from Goliath. But David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He didn't see the height of Goliath. He didn't see that he was a mighty warrior, a mighty savior. He didn't see the fierceness of that enemy. He saw God. And he said, my God will this day deliver you in my hands. And you know the Bible says? When he went out to face Goliath with a slingshot, he ran towards the giant and the stone sunk in his head and he grabbed Goliath's sword and he cut off the head and he took the bloody stump back to camp and he says look what my God has done I think it's time we start carrying around a bunch of bloody stumps you know what I'm saying listen the enemy he, he, he is absolutely scared to death that you are going to get a revelation of the resurrection of Jesus in your heart that if God be for you, who can be against you? Now, I, I began to go through the scriptures, and I discovered at least 24 different things the resurrection should mean to you and I. I'm going to get into that some tonight. But I'm telling you what, man, if you get a hold of the revelation that Christ is real, he's alive, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Matter of fact, I had a vision of him last year. I didn't see him no longer at the side of the Father. I, sitting, I saw him sitting upon the white charger getting ready to come and take his church home. But I believe with all my heart that God is stirring a sovereign move of God. You know what a sovereign move of God is? I've had a sovereign move of God upon my heart at times. That's how I got born again. As far as I know, nobody ever witnessed to me. Nobody ever talked to me. And here I was in that little bathroom. We called it the head in the Navy. I had that knife, that big old survival knife to my wrist. I got ready to cut my wrist. I was going to kill myself. I wasn't faking it. I wasn't baby sewing it. I was going to do it. And all of a sudden, Jesus showed up in my bathroom. He showed up. Do you know Jesus will show up in your shower? He'll show up in your car. He'll show up. My heart was crying out, God, there's got to be something more. I don't want to live like this. I don't want to be this way. If there's nothing more, I don't want this world. And he showed up, and I fell down on my knees, and I called out to him, and he was there. He showed up. He saved me. He rescued me. And a couple of weeks later, I was seeking Jesus. Didn't know anything about speaking in tongues, but I got filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. My speech impediment was gone. It's never come back. Seeking Jesus, crying to Jesus, and he healed my lungs. He healed my hearing. He healed my sinuses. He healed my physical body. And I began to discover there was a world, there was a dimension, there was a place that I did not know existed. But it only came by seeking Jesus. And the angel of the Lord shows up and says, don't be afraid, for I know that you are seeking Jesus. Oh, you want the, you want the attention of the angelic world? You want, you want God's attention? You want, you want God to show up? You want God to manifest in your house, in your bedroom, at your kitchen table, in your car, at your work or place, in your church? Get to seeking Jesus. Just get to crying out. Forget all the other agendas. Forget all of the other desires. Say, Lord, I want you. I want, yeah, but Pastor Mike, if I get to seeking like Jesus like that, I won't be a good worker. I won't be a good father. I won't be a good mother. I'll neglect my duties. You're wrong. See, because before I got born again, I, 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 they, they, the, the military couldn't trust me to do anything. They didn't know what to do with me. And, and, and most times in the military, when you come to the end of your years, they ask you to re-up. They never asked me to re-up. <laughs> they were glad to get rid of me, man. I, I was, uh, you know, I, I was uh, Murphy going somewhere to happen, if you know what that was. Murphy. Accidents happen everywhere. And, and you know what, though? The last three months of my military life, they put me in charge over whole battalions. I became pr more productive, more beneficial, better worker than I had ever been. You know why? Because Jesus showed up. Why did Jesus show up, Pastor Mike? Because I was seeking him. See, you seek him and he'll show up. He wants to show up. But you know what? Jesus ain't going to come where he's not wanted. I'm talking about in your heart. See, he's looking for a vessel. Did you know the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are roaming to and fro upon the face of the whole earth? He's trying to find someone whose heart is after him. He's looking. You, you ought to be start waving, you know, like when you see a helicopter flying over and you're out there in the midst of the ocean and your boat has sunk and you're saying, here I am, Jesus. Go ahead. Jesus, here I am. <laughs> Come on, man. He'll show up. He'll step in. I can't tell you how many nights I have woke up 
and the hair on the back of my neck stood up and I knew that Jesus was there. I knew an angel was there. I knew that God was speaking to me and I'd roll out of bed crying and weeping and I'd lay on my face and God would give me a dream or a vision or an inspiration or a word or a revelation of his truth. But it always came when I was seeking him. And this angel, this angel, he says, I know, I know you're seeking Jesus. That's what he said. He says, which was crucified. He is not here. And now this, he says an amazing statement. He says, for he is risen. He's alive. Can you imagine? I mean, first of all, it's fright. It, it, can you imagine the ups and the downs they've been through? First of all, they're as low as you can get, man. They're, you know, precious Jesus has been, has been murdered. He's been lied about. He's died. His body's in a tomb now for three days. And his body's already beginning to, to, to become corrupted, you know, beginning to decay and stink. And, and you come down there and, 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 and he's no longer. And first of all, if you'll read all the translations, they first looked inside of the tomb and he was gone he says, where have you laid my savior mary said magdalene where have you put my savior and then here the angel appears on the door and he begins to speak to him an angel shows up how I many need an angel to show up in your life <laughs> You know, I know some, uh, about a year ago, there was a guy who was really criticized because he had a female angel. I've had a female angel for the last 30 years. Her name is Kathy. <laughs> And <laughs> she speaks to me all the time. <laughs> but there is no other kind of female angel. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I want, except yours, you know. Tell you, tell you, husband, go ahead and tell your wife, you're my angel. <laughs> Come on, man, you're my angel. And don't tell her because you always play the harp. Don't tell her that. Don't tell her because she's always harping. I'm not saying that. But notice what it goes on to hear. L listen, he is not here for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And verse 7, and go what? Quickly. Now, the Greek word for quickly means to run. He said, now run. Run. Go tell him. Go tell him. Why would you run? Well, you got to run with the vision. You got to run. See, the Bible says we're in a race. You know, that's the problem. Lukewarmness, sit around and you play with your thumbs. You sit around and you waste time. But you know what? Uh, Lester Summerall, which he had gone home to be with the Lord, he wrote, a, he wrote a book many years ago called Run with the Vision. And as a young believer, I picked up that book and actually got connected to Lester. He'd come and speak for us here, and I got ordained through him. And I was actually on the satellite network with him five days out of the week. And, 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 and Lester wrote a book called Run with the Vision. And we got to run. We got to stop sitting around. We got to, and you know, Jesus gave the parable about the men working in a field. And he saw these two guys at the end of the day. They were sitting there. And he, he said, what are you doing sitting? He said, Lord, nobody will hire us. It's too late in the day. He said, I hire you. Get out there for the harvest is great. But the laborers are few. Do you know a lot of people think it's the preacher that's supposed to do all the running when people snap their fingers? No, you're supposed to run. You're supposed to run. God still has, I don't believe in retirement. I believe in refirement. See, I'm never going to retire. You say, oh, I can't wait to pass to be hit 65, 68. He'll retire. No, I'm not. I'm refiring. If the Lord should tarry and I live another 30 years, another 40 years, I'll still be here preaching. We had that dear sister come in last year. She's 100 years old and has 2010 vision. A black American sister, African American sister, and she's still driving. She told me last year she drove herself all the way out to California. Matter of fact, I said to her, it's like, you, you didn't. She had about five other ladies with her. I said, sister, you, 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 didn't, you didn't drive up here, did you? You let one of the sisters drive. She looked at me like she wanted to slap me. Sure, I drove. Yeah, I drove. Well, listen, brothers and sisters, we, he says, quickly go tell him. Quickly what? Preach the resurrection. Preach the fact that Christ is alive. He's coming again. He's sitting on the throne. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He overcame principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over him in it. And there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Woo, about preach myself happy. <laughs> He's alive. See, and that's what the angel was telling Mary, these two Marys. He's alive like he's sad. He is alive like he's sad. 
He still heals like he said. He still provides like he says. He still delivers like he said. What did he say? Whatever he said, he still does it. If he ever did it before, he'll do it again. If he ever raised the dead, cleansed the lepers, opened the eyes of the blind, not stopped the ears of the deaf, made the dumb to talk, and the lame to dance, he'll do it again. He'll do it again to those who believe he'll do it again. See, brothers and sisters, you and I have to believe he'll do it again. Do you believe he'll do it again? We have to believe it. So he is not here. Go quickly. Tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. Verse 8. I love this. Man, this little lady, you know, some people say, I don't believe in women preachers. Well, the first woman evangelist, the first woman preacher, the first person that declared the resurrection of Christ was a woman who had seven devils cast out of her and, li and lived an ungodly life, but she got delivered. And was she a preacher? And so when she heard the angels say, this is what you should do. Verse 7, and they went quickly and go quickly. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. Fear, it was, what kind of fear was that? What kind of fear was that? It was a divine fear, a holy fear, a majestic fear, a, a mind-boggling fear. I, I remember when, uh, when I had an angel come into my barracks and I was simply Seeking Jesus. That's all I was doing. I'm not looking for angelic visitations, but they'll come. Paul said, I, you know, I've had revelations. Uh, I said, and, 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 and he said, I, I've had dreams. I've had visions. Uh, uh, and, and he says, and there's yet more to come. Tell somebody there's more to come. How does it come, Pastor Mike? You seek Jesus. I don't seek signs, wonders, or miracles. They follow the preaching of the word. But you seek Jesus. And all of a sudden, that, that it says we look through a glass darkly, but then face to face. We know in part and we prophesy in part. But then that which is perfect has come. Then all of that is done away with. And I'm telling you something in the spirit. That as you begin to seek Jesus, the darkness that surrounds your mind and your heart, the sorrow that surrounds you, the depression that surrounds you, the fear, the anxiety, the worry that surrounds you would begin to dissipate when the sun comes up and it begins to burn off the fog. It'll just begin to disappear. And you'll say, why was I ever worried about that? Why did I get upset? How come I was so fearful? And I'll tell you the reason why. is because you didn't see Jesus. But you know what? When you see him, everything's different. See, one minute it's nothing but death, and the next minute it's nothing but life. What a radical change. And so notice what happened to these people. Oh, man. It says, and they did run. It says, from the sepulcher with fear and what kind of joy? The word great joy there means they are ecstatic, ecstasy. They, ha, has your heart ever been filled so much with joy you could hardly breathe? So much joy. I mean, we've had those meetings in a service where people all of a sudden got filled with supernatural joy. People laughed and, 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 and giggled and carried on like you couldn't believe. I remember one night we were having a meeting here with Brother Gil Howard Brown, and we lived across the parking lot, and Michael was only about, I don't know, 10 years old, and me and him got filled with the joy of the Lord. We got so drunk, father and son walking across the parking lot trying to hold up each other, each other just so full of joy, so drunk in the spirit that when we got into the house, I had to use the banister to haul myself up to bed. <laughs> My wife was at the top of the stairs, and she looked down at me and said, what are you doing? It was like a drunk man coming. Coming home, I was so full of the joy of the Lord. You know, some people don't want no joy. They don't want no joy. They, they want to be pickled in lemon juice or pickle juice or something. They, you know, they don't want no joy, but, but we need joy. Well, Pastor Mike, if you're in my shoes, you wouldn't have no joy. Let me tell you something. You get to seeking Jesus and joy will come. It, it might not happen right away, but you seek him by faith. He's, he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. You just begin to seek him and seek him and seek him and seek him. You know what? I, I, years and years ago, we'll get ready here to finish. But years ago, I got caught up in a book. I was given a book by somebody somehow about having what we call a user-friendly church. And that was the beginning of the end. And in the book, it began to talk about trying to reach people where they're at in their, in, in their uh, emotional, physical needs. Instead of, instead of exalting Jesus, it was like uh, have a cappuccino bar with jelly-filled donuts. No, no, come on, now listen to me. Uh, you need to have a gymnasium. Uh, uh, you, you need to have games. You need to play Super Bowl on Super Bowl night, you know, on a big screen TV. And, begin, and I began to do all these things. But what happened is the enemy came into the church by these 
frivolous vanities. Pastor Mike, are you attacking people? I'm attacking myself. I'm saying I was stupid. I was gullible. I fell for it. Uh, and, and see, God spoke to me. He said, son, how did I raise up that church? He said, I did it by the Holy Ghost. I did it by the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. I did it by the word of the Lord. I did it by the Spirit of God. I did it by showing up because you were seeking my face. And I tell you what, and to get out of that gutter, once you get in that gutter, once you set up the programs, once you get people addicted to the jelly-filled donuts and the coffee and, and the big screen TVs and the basketball games and the baseball games and all of these other games in the church. Well, Pastor Mike, we can't reach our youth if we don't have these. That is such a lie. We had a move of God. It must have been close to 20-some years ago. We had a move of God where all of a sudden God hit our high school and hit our grade school. They began to weep and cry and pray. They would come, and back in them days, the, the, the pool boys were with us and all these other kids, and they would come into the sanctuary, and our high school and our grade school would lay on their face, and they'd weep and wail and cry out to God, and they got on fire for Jesus. See, but somehow the enemy came in. See, the enemy is always going to try to stop that resurrection power. See, if you're born again, if you're washed in the blood, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, that Jesus is now inside of you waiting to explode into humanity. He wants to come out upon the pages of history. You know, we read about all these wonderful things that God used to do. It's time we see it now. And I'll tell you right now, we don't need all the hype. We don't need all the fancy lights. We don't need all the expensive equipment. We don't need all of this stuff. I'm saying we can use it, but that's not going to get the job done. Hollywood has the most expensive equipment you can imagine, and they don't have a move of God. We need a move of God. How do we get a move of God, Pastor Mike? By getting the move of God in you. See, let there be a move of God in Pastor Mike. Well, Pastor Mike, you always seem to have a move of God, and then you go back. You always have a move of God, and you go back. I know. <laughs> Somebody please kick me, you know. I tell you what, man, up and down, up and down, up and down, you know, and, uh, you know, and it makes me sick. You know, my, my kids, they love to go on carnival rides. And here a couple years ago, we went up to Allen. Uh, it was this big waterside park up in Allenstown somewhere. And there is this weird looking roller coaster system where you grab a hole. They strap you in and your hand and, and it takes you upside down all around everywhere it's way. And my wife gets on that and she is. Woo! It's like Danny. When Danny was a little kid, he was just a little blonde haired kid. He'd spin and spin and spin until his eyes would go up in the back of his head and he thought it was the funnest thing in the world he'd fall down and couldn't get back up so my kids they finally convinced me come on dad you can handle that come on dad I'm looking at that thing it's twisting and turning they're upside down every which way I thought I don't want to do that man I don't want to go up and down up and down every which way I don't want to make me sick oh no dad so I got in there and they strapped me in I felt like I was getting in a tomb you know in a casket and the thing took off and, and all of a sudden it's like oh I, I'm telling you in less than a minute I got sick I closed my eyes. It was the longest five-minute ride of my life. I thought I was going to die. Oh, oh, I'm just hanging on. I, I must have been like a baby. I bet you could have heard me groaning three, three of the carts back. Oh, oh, help me, Jesus. Help me. I mean, oh, it was terrible. And finally, the thing stopped. And I go, Shh, I'm running a fever. I'm sick. I was sick the rest of that day and for the next couple of days. My, 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 I don't understand how your thyroid can handle that. Your balance system, your inner ear can handle that. But you know what? That's the way I go spiritually sometimes. Oh, man, up and down, up and down, up and down. And the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. But the day's got to come. You say, how do you do it, Pastor Mike? Just, you know, sometimes you just got to do it every five, it, for every, it's like a man coming off of alcohol. You, you know, and, 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 and they, they, they just, you know, they always say, you know, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Or what they're really trying to say is if you've ever given in to the habit of alcohol, and, of course, they don't understand the power of Christ, you better watch out because you could go back and do it. But the Bible says be careful if a man thinks he's staying. Let him take heed lest he fall. I don't care who you are. Paul said he could have become a castaway. And so I tell you, how do you do, how do, you do with this, the, these things of the flesh that are contrary to the heart of God? What you do is you deal with them. It, it might take every 10 minutes, segment. Every Every 10 minutes. You, you know, can I say something, love? I tell you what, so many people, a lot of people, you know, we attack people who are addicted to tobacco. And, and it's, 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 a, it's a bad habit. People who are addicted to alcohol. You know, people are addicted to soap operas. It'll kill your walk with God. Addicted to vain, violent movies. It'll kill your walk with God. It will, I mean, it grieves the Holy Spirit. 
It says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are in this day of redemption. And here we are saying, oh, God, please move, please save, please deliver, please move me. And, and, and yet he's saying, well, son, I want to, I really do. I want you to be a vessel unto honor, meet for the master's use, prepare to have a good work. But, you know, son, you got to stop gossiping. You, you got to stop lying. You, you got you to stop filling your mind with filth. You, you got to get on your knees. You got to begin to pray. You got to begin to seek me. You got to begin to say, God, give me, give, give me revival or let me die. You know, I'm telling you truthfully, uh, Sister Pritt said to me this morning, uh, wasn't that this morning, Mrs. Pritt, when she said, Pastor, do you know one man can change the course of history? I said, yeah, you're preaching my sermon. That's what, what one man can change the course of history. One man, one woman committed and dedicated to God. It's like, and, and, and you know what? It spreads. See, people understand sin does spread. Sin spreads, gossip spreads, strife spreads, division spreads, bitterness spreads. That's why the Bible says take heed lest a root of bitterness comes into your heart and many be defiled. You know, if you're bitter at your husband or you're bitter at your wife, you'll spread that bitterness. It's, it's like having the flu, you know. It's like having some kind of infectious disease. But I'm telling you right now, if you get infected with the love of God, it'll spread. You get filled with the Holy Ghost, it'll spread. You just push your way through. Just be a man. huh? Be a woman of God. Just say, I'm going to do it. Yeah, but my husband. Yeah, but my wife. Yeah, but my children. Yeah, but my parents. Yeah, 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 but, but, but. You're not a goat. We're sheep. We're sheep. Just say, I'm going to do it. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to press my way into the Holy of Holies. I'm going to take a hold of, of, of the garment of Jesus. I, I, if I can but touch his garment, I know healing will flow. People will be delivered. People will be set free. If I can but get a hold of his garment, revival will come. See, a little lady with an issue of blood had it for 12 years. She was weak. She made up her mind. I'm not going home without getting a hold of Jesus. You know what, if you had that attitude coming to church, man, we would have revival. I'm not going anywhere past the mic till I get a hold of Jesus. There's the altar. That's what they used to have altar uh, uh, calls for. People used to be at the altars 24 hours a day because you know what? They said, I'm not going nowhere. I want, my, I want my kids born again and loving God. I want my cousins. I want my neighbors. I want my mom and dad. I want my community. I want our society to be touched by God. And I'm not going nowhere until Jesus, you grant my request. I'm going to be like Jacob that wrestled with the angel and I don't care if you knock my hip out I'm not going until you bless me say bless me Lord <laughs> are you all ready to be blessed yet so notice what it says and they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy and did what and they did run to bring his disciples word verse 9 and as they went to tell his disciples behold Jesus met them Jesus met them as they went to do the work of God. Now, remember, up to this time, they, they've had an angelic visitation. Uh, they've been touched spiritually. But now as they are going, as they are going, Jesus meets them in the act of going. You know, brothers and sisters, as you and I go to do the will of God, Jesus will show up. He'll just, boom, there he is. Like, where did he come from? He just manifested out of thin air he just there he was he showed up and the first thing he what is the first thing he says all hail another translation says be filled with great joy or rejoice the first thing he says to his, his these two ladies he's talking to these two ladies he said get happy people why i'm alive <laughs> i've overcome the devil he goes on in Matthew 20, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. He said, get happy. You know what? Jesus shows up in your life and you'll be happy. <laughs> That's why you can tell Jesus is not in a lot of people's lives. They're not happy. Jesus shows up and all of a sudden it's like, hey, you know what, God? I ain't got a problem in this world. I, I, I just laugh at the devil. God is so good. Hello? I mean, you'll just be bubbling out of your belly. will flow rivers of living water. You know what? Jesus shows up in your life. You come out of your prayer closet, out of your bedroom, and you'll be smiling from ear to ear. And they'll say, how come you're so happy? <laughs> 
They'll be mad at you. How come you're so happy? Don't you care about my problems? Oh, no, I found someone greater than your problems. I found someone greater than your sickness. I found someone greater than your difficulty. I found someone greater than anything that you can ever deal with. His name is Jesus, and he's here. Silver and gold have I not, but such as I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk, you crippled. <laughs> we got a lot of cripples in the church today. They lay him at the door of the temple. They're cripples spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, financially. They're cripples. But the, we, we got to have some Peters. We need some Johns. We need some Marys. Hello? We need some. Say, Lord, give us some. Ma say, Lord, make me one. And so he says, hail. And they came and they held him by their feet. And he worshiped him, verse 10, once again. Then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid. Again, don't be afraid. Especially now, people, don't be afraid. The stock market, pastor. The banking system, pastor. I lost my job, pastor. No business, pastor. I ain't got no insurance, pastor. Oh, the doctor says I've got cancer, pastor. Be not afraid. Don't be afraid. Why? Because Jesus. See, like I said, there's... 20 some reasons why we ought to shout one of the reasons why we ought to shout it says in the in the bottom of, of chapter 28 he says i'll never leave you nor forsake you i don't have no friend you got jesus he sticks closer than a brother I just, I just don't, I don't, I just don't feel like he's there. Well, listen, here I am laying in bed in my house, and my wife is out in the kitchen. I begin to scream out, Kathy, Kathy, why'd you leave me? Why'd you leave me? And she comes in and says, shut up, I'm right here. <laughs> what are you belly aching about? I'm right here. <laughs> you know, you know, we always pray, oh, Lord, please go with us. Well, I'm not attacking people, but that's just a sign they don't understand. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Who leaves? We leave. We forsake him. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. For how long? To the end of the world. Here's another promise. When it looks like it's the end of the world, I'm a goner. It's the end. It's all over with. We're sunk. We're going to lose everything. He said, I'm with you. Even at the end of your world. Why? Because he is the resurrection and the life. You ever, you know, right now, America, you listen even to the conservative talk show host. It's the end. Communism, socialism, it's the end. Oh, the new world order. One global currency. <laughs> listen, he said, I will be with you at the end. <laughs> oh, Pastor Mike, you just don't understand. It's, the, it's, it's just the end. I just feel like it's over with. It's too late. I'm a goner. Well, that's when he works the best. Lazarus was in the tomb four days. He stunk. He said, come out. He said, I am the resurrection and life. And Lazarus came out. I unwrapped the grave clothes, and he was made better than new. <laughs> Became a powerful tool for God. They actually even tried to figure a way to kill him again, you know. But I want you to realize something. He's the only man, I, I think, in the world that ever has died twice, you know. No, there was a young man, too. Whoever Jesus raised from the dead, they died and went home to be with the Lord. But here's the, here's the truth, brothers and sisters. You may feel like you are already dead and buried in the casket. It's over with. It's over with. I remember this one sister in our church that she had a marriage that had totally fallen apart, totally. And her husband was gone, and she said, Pastor Mike, I'm, I'm going to believe God for my husband. And, and, and everybody was telling her, you know, just you have a biblical right. She had a biblical right to let him go, a scriptural right, you know, so forth. And so on. I said, sister, I'm going to stand. You want to believe God? I'm going to believe God with you. I'm going to believe God with you. And so every time I'd see her, I'd say, we're believing, and I would stand, and I would pray, and I, I would fast with her some. And my, si my wife agreed, and, and you know what? One day that man came home, and them kids wept, and the mother wept, and everybody shouted, and that man is serving God to this day. And that precious sister is here this morning, and I want you to know God raised her husband out of the, out of the tomb. See, God raised her husband out of the tomb. She never gave up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Tell your neighbor, don't give up. <laughs> you know, I mean, the resurrection and life is still here. So he says, he says, be not afraid. Go tell thy brethren that, that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. Go once again. Tell them, tell them, tell them. Shout it from the rooftops. Declare it. Proclaim it. Tell them. 
And then he manifested himself in verse 17. And when they saw him, Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. You, all, you, you, you understand, I, I hate to say this. There are those here today, you're going to doubt. Those who are watching by, by, by ra uh, listening by radio or audio or watching by internet or TV, they're going to doubt. I, I just don't know. Well, we got to prove the doubters wrong. See, don't attack the doubters. Don't belittle the doubters. Don't come against the doubters. They, they, you know, Jesus said, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. A lot of people just won't believe. Uh, uh, here, 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 here's a quick story. This, is, this really happened. There was a, uh, we were holding a revival up in the Huntington Fair, State Fair. Had a tent up. I was out there preaching. My wife was out there, you know, ministering. Okay, Michael. And, uh, and there was a guy standing behind a tree every night. His name was George Fitzgerald. He was the treasurer for uh, the state Huntington Fair, the state fair and, or the Huntington County Fair. And uh, I'd, I'd watch him standing behind the tree. And one day I was out there, and we had all of our curtains up, and we had our tent set up next to the bingo, the fireman's bingo booth. And they were really upset because I'm over there preaching and they're trying to call out their bingo numbers. So we put down the curtains on that side for at least that way it would cut some of the noise down. And I'm out there preaching, man. I'm out there preaching. I'm out there preaching. As I'm preaching, uh, people are standing. There's more people on the outside looking in than there's on the inside. And as I look out there, all of a sudden this little old lady, she fell under the spirit. She crumpled. People began to crumple outside. And I sent the worker, I said, go bring him in. So they ran out and grabbed that little old lady, brought her in. She got gloriously born again, filled the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. The church started out of that movement. A church of close to 300 people started out, out of that tent meeting, you know. But all of a sudden, there was this guy walking by. And he had a, he had a pair of crutches. He's walking by. And the Spirit of God, out of your mouth, they just comes. I said, you, sir, with the crutches. I said, come up here. God's going to heal you right now. He kind of stopped. He looked at me. He kept on walking. I said, no, no, three times. And finally, he didn't have no choice. He, he came walking up, had his, his, uh, his, his crutches. And I said to him, I said, I'm going gonna, I said, I'm gonna to pray. I said, what's, what's wrong? He said, well, he didn't tell me what was wrong. I said, I'm going to pray, and God's going to heal whatever's wrong with your legs. Uh, I said, do you believe that? He wouldn't answer me. He didn't believe it. I said, okay. I said, I'm going to pray. And so I laid my hands on him. I commanded his, his knees or his body to be healed. I said, be healed in Jesus' name. Not a long-winded prayer. I said, okay, go ahead, put down the crutches and walk. Well, he wouldn't do it. So I grabbed the crutches. I pulled them away from him. I threw them on the ground. I spun them around, and I pushed them. And he took off. He was probably a man in his early 30s. He took off. And all of a sudden, he, he started walking normal. Come in. He started crying. He started weeping. And, 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 and I said, here, tell us what happened. He took the mic. He said, he, he was weeping. He said, you don't understand. You don't understand what happened. I said, well, tell us what happened. He said, last winter I was walking on a sidewalk. There was ice on the sidewalk. He said, I fell on that knee. He said, I totally destroyed my kneecap. They're supposed to do a, a kneecap replacement in another week or two weeks, I think it was. And, and, and I'm healed. I'm healed. And he's crying. Well, George Fitzgerald is watching this. See, he's watching this. And so uh, uh, that young man left. He called me back, gave him my home number. He said he went in, uh, walked into the doctors. The doctor looked and said, what happened? And he told him what happened. He said, well, let's get an x-ray. Put it underneath the x-ray. He said, you got a new kneecap. He said, your kneecap is. Now, that George Fitzgerald, I had tried to reach George. He had been an atheist, an atheist. And you know what? I went to Germany when I came back. He called me up. Matter of fact, he didn't call me up. I walked into that French church of mine that we started out of that tent meeting, and he was in there praising God, speaking in tongues, and he was one of Sparky Price's elders. But he had been an atheist. See, we have got to give evidence to the resurrection of Jesus. How can we do that, Pastor Mike? Verse 28, Jesus said, he spoke unto them, saying, All power, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Well, okay, what should we do, Lord? Go ye therefore and, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even unto the ends of the world. Amen. Do you know what, brothers and sisters? He said all power was his. All power. All power. So how much power does the devil have? None. Well, Pastor Mike, then if, if, if God has, Jesus has all power, he's overcome the devil, he's defeated the enemy, he led captivity captive, he's given gifts on the man. All of these wonderful truths were centered up in heavenly places, were seated in heavenly places, were the chosen, were the elect, all these wonderful things the resurrection did for us and the same spirits in us. And how come we're not getting the same results? Because we're, we, we, we're, not, we're not where we need to be spiritually. 
See, we need to get where we need to be spiritually. See, we're on a journey. Did you know that? We're all on a journey. Now, some people would have you think, well, once saved, always saved. You prayed a prayer, now you're good to go. No, that's not a journey. That's not a journey. You're not like on a, seven, you know, a 747 uh, being taken to heaven. You are on a walking journey. You are running. Matter of fact, the Bible says run the race. Run it as if only one person can win it. He, he didn't say sit on your blessed assurance. He said run. Run quickly. Did you notice that? He said quickly now. Quickly. Why? Don't lose that passion. Don't lose that zeal. Don't sit around. Don't suck your thumb. Hello. Come on now. Get up. Let's go. Come on. You know what? When you lose that spot nudity, when you lose that, let's go. Let's get. Let's do it. When you lose that zeal, you are in trouble. You got to, well, Pastor Mike, how do you ever get it back? Well, you've had to do it. Have you ever been laid off of a job and you just kind of lay around and you begin to put on a couple more pounds and, and all of a sudden, one day, you just wake up and say, you know what? I'm tired of laying around. I got to do something. And you finally get up, and you go out, and you find a job, and you begin to do something. Hello? Y'all still here? Are y'all runners or whiners? <laughs> I'm a runner. Say, I'm a runner. I'm running for Jesus. Oh, we got to run, people. Let's get up and run. Let's go. He's alive. He's risen from the dead. He's inside of us. This is a day of victory. This is a day of praise. This is a day of celebration because he's alive. I'm alive because he lives. I live. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Come on. Hallelujah. <laughs> he's alive. The world don't know it. I, I read a statistic just yesterday. It's so good news. They asked the American people, do you believe there was a historical man by the name of Jesus? 88% said yes. Do you believe this man named Jesus actually rose again from the dead? 78% said yes. You know, there's no other nation on the face of the earth that believes that like we do as Americans. They believe he's still alive. And so... There's, you know what, you go into a lot of these nations, you got to fight their culture. You know, the India with the Hindus and, uh, and, and, and over in, in, in Saudi Arabia and those areas, uh, the Mohammedan faith and, and, and different China, Buddha, you know. And, and, but in America, we don't have to fight that stuff. 78% believe he's already been raised from the dead. But now we got to give them evidence. we got to show them what God has for them. That God has a better life for them. And you need to know that. You need to experience the resurrection power of Christ. Amen. And you know what? As they were seeking Jesus, an angel showed up and Jesus showed up. And I mean, God was there. I'm telling you right now, seek Jesus. Tell your neighbor, seek Jesus. And God will show up. He'll show up. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this morning that we could gather together to celebrate, to worship, to praise. Lord, I thank you that we're not moved by the circumstances. We're not being moved by the natural. It may look like that, Father God, that uh, the enemy is on top and we're on the bottom. But, Lord, we're the head and not the tail. We're on top and not underneath. We're more than conquerors through Christ who loved us, and the greater one lives inside of us. Now, Lord, let this revelation, this knowledge, this vision become alive inside of us. And, Lord, help us to quickly, quickly go tell our brethren he's alive and he's well in Jesus' name. And everybody shouts amen. amen. Well, that same